I heard that the only time they filled up the audience before here was when they had the, I guess the historical society has, has a, some kind of a seminar of this sort that fills up. And that's kind of cool because if you think about it, especially for the young people I see sitting here, this case or these cases are really historical. They're part of our history, not just local history, but national history, part of our nation's history. They're certainly on the level of Jack the Ripper in England, uh, uh, unquestionably so. So when you take that into account, uh, you're participating tonight in a little part of that, I think, is the idea. And so I, I, you know, I'm happy to have you all. And I'm John Ray, I guess you know that, uh, the lawyer for the family of Shannon Gilbert and uh, Jessica Taylor. Uh, so I come in both of the, you know, as one of the, as a lawyer for one of the victims who was dismembered, that's Jessica, and for Shannon who was controversial and is at the heart and center of the case because it was with Shannon Gilbert that this case began. Uh, so I guess there's any number of things I could talk about but let, let me just start by telling you a little, little bit about what happened, nothing exciting, but what happened to me. We got a, a tip about, oh, four or five days before the arrest took place. And we had a tip from an extremely um, excellent source that there would be an arrest being made within a few days, or the police would be revealing something about DNA. And maybe they were planning on that, and then they had to make the arrest. But the tip was a good one. So when I received the call at 6.20 a.m. that the arrest had been made, I got out of bed, and my dresser is about as far away as this lady is. And before I got to the dresser, the media was on the phone. <laughs> and I, I'm not exaggerating to say that the media was on the phone or on our computer or on the phone or on the office phone without a break until 12 midnight wow. from 6.20 in the morning. And uh, what does Joe Biden say? No joke. Uh, that's really true, uh, what I just said. And uh, the, the next day, it was exactly the same. Uh, that was... Bastille Day, that was uh, Friday, and then on Saturday, uh, it, the, the exact same process took place. It only stopped at midnight because I just shut it off and went to sleep. Uh, honestly, they would have kept coming. And then on, uh, the next day, it, the same thing happened. Got out of bed, they, we couldn't get to breakfast before the, they were asking me to appear on this, do that, what about this, do you know that? And then on Sunday, we had the same experience. I went with my daughter in a mass, and by the time we got in the car, we were getting the calls already uh, at nine o'clock in the morning, so in, the, in all of that rain that we had. So, uh, and it's continued right up until now. Uh, I ran like a fool to get here because we just finished with um, uh, Greta Van Susterand, and before that, it was Inside Edition had come over uh, to the office, and. Uh, two or three other uh, TV shows and radio shows called and I talked to them uh, all afternoon until I got here. So forgive the voice, it's a little weary. Uh, the soul is very weary. And you know, otherwise uh, I'm still ready to talk all about it and ask, answer any of your questions that you have, all right? So that's kind of the, the gist of what has happened so far. Uh, maybe we start with this, that I, as a lawyer for 12 years in this case, up until this happened, and my clients, the, 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 the victims' families, we were very delighted, elated, that the arrest was made. I was a little disappointed when I woke up because we had not pinpointed that fellow. We didn't know of him. Uh, so I felt bad that, that I, you know, all the work we did, we didn't, we didn't 
figure that out. But even so, we were elated that finally this, this terrible monster was caught and taken away on the streets, off the streets, and that there was some end that looked like it was in sight. We felt that way for a while until we started to think about it collectively and recognize that that was this, you know, the, the heads and the coin and the tails was that because of that uh, work that was fantastically done by the task force that was created by District Attorney Ray Tierney, uh, I think he came from St. Anthony's, didn't he? So he's a local guy. Uh, and uh, by Rodney Harrison, the police commissioner, putting together th this uh, task force, everything that hadn't been done was done. Uh, so, you know, you can't be more delighted in that that that, that, that that kind of work, that we're still, our system is still capable of producing that kind of work and we have those kinds of relentless individuals uh, working for us. Those two gentlemen were new. You know, Ray just got elected, and Rodney, uh, who's my friend, uh, re you know, relatively recently got appointed as, as police commissioner. So up until they came in, the tail side of the coin was that the work wasn't being done because it was pretty much in the hands exclusively of the Suffolk County Police Department. And that, and that nothing was solved, nothing was done. So in direct, you, you can see that when they formed the task force and brought in the FBI, uh, with whom I, I and my a, a little uh, team of researchers have been in, you know, had been in steady contact with and we had been giving them evidence that we had, when they brought that, the FBI into it, made the task force uh, and the sheriff's office, uh, that was in January. And within less than two months, they already had a major lead that broke the case and they were on their way to the end. Admittedly, very sophisticated, difficult work, but that's what police do. And it took them only that much time to do that. So the, next, the question on the, on the tail side of the coin is this, where were the law enforcement people, not the, not the U.S. attorney or or uh, the, the FBI, but the Suffolk County Police Department, couldn't they have uh, delved into this kind of evidence and brought this case to a head and identified at least this fellow well before the task force did it in the snap of a number of weeks? That, that is a question that naturally occurred to us uh, and, you know, it was bothersome, but by the time I got done with four days of, of media, you know, I've spoken to people from every possible place you can imagine in the media, people from England, people from South Africa, uh, and without almost, well, I should say with almost without exception, they all had the same question. So it, it wasn't I who was stirring the pot and generating that issue. That issue was there, and we really need uh, don't we? An explanation and some discussion, some involvement in why did that happen? So that's the other side of the coin. And I, I think the answer, perhaps it's no longer important. People have said to me, move on. It's, it's not important anymore. Really? Yeah. Well, I think it's always important yeah. because what, what's at stake is, is the concept of justice. And, uh, and the the spirits and the souls of the dead that do matter. They do exist. They are real, they're present, and they count still. So they are unrequited. Now there's three who are about to experience justice, and most likely the fourth. And those are the ones, as you know, covered with the burlap, the, as they call them, the Gilgo Four, who were buried, not buried, but left intact weren't chopped up in any way. Uh, they're about to get their dose of justice. But what about the others? And of the others, we know that there exist another seven. There were 11 altogether, counting Shannon Gilbert. Uh, 
not yet. Now, there'll be a lot of issues, I'm sure it's occurred to you all, that, you know, did this, this, this monster, this huge ogre of a monster, we, we saw him at the arraignment, I was there with my staff at the arraignment, and uh, the man's size was immense. His hands were twice the size of mine, and uh, he had this big ogre-like head. Um, and he kind of looked across, the, he came, when he came in, he looked out, and he stared, and he looked around a little bit. And uh, I detected on his face, and I watched carefully for these things. I'm a trial lawyer for 41 years. So I watched him, and I thought I saw what I saw in the mugshot. Look at the mugshot more carefully. Never look at the eyes and say, aha, it's in the eyes that you'll see the evil. You don't see the evil in the eyes. You see it in the mouth. Look at his mouth. He's smirking. He's barely holding it back. And that's the way he looked when he looked around, with that same kind of almost a sneer. It didn't quite reach that point. He couldn't. But that's what you could see if you looked carefully enough. And this monster, I mean, I call him, his name is Rex. I call him Tyrannosaurus Rex. Right? Uh, because how, big, how big was he? Six he's about six foot five. He's, they say he weighed 240. I think he weighed probably more like closer to 300. His head alone looked like it weighed about 100 pounds I mean, or more. He, he, he's just a huge man. Uh, and, and when you see the pictures of him when he's obese and he's sitting there, it does no justice until you actually see the guy. You can imagine how terrifying he was to those women when he did what he did. All right. And what did they say? Well, he, you know, we're Americans. We all believe in the, uh, you know, the notion of innocence. No, we don't. Nobody says you have to do that. We do that in a court of law. That's our law. That's not for the public. You have every right to conclude that he's guilty. And I'm one of the public, and I'm not his lawyer, so I say he's guilty. It's overwhelmingly likely that he is. Uh, and so when you look at that and you look at that creature that he could do that, you really have to, I digress a little bit, but you have to wonder, you know, how did that happen? And all of our training in psychology and sociology and so on is going to tell us answers that, oh, he might have been abused as a kid, uh, all these things. But you might also ask yourself, and I've had 33 homicides in my career, um, I've handled in one way or another on the victim side or on the defendant side, never on the prosecution side. Um, you look at these people and say, wait a minute, can anything justify what they, they came to? How did that happen? I'll give you a suggestion in my, my subjective belief, and it could be wrong, but he was addicted to child pornography and he was addicted to the dark web type of torture, pain, and death associated with sexual delight, sexual ecstasy. And when you have those things, how, how, you, you say, well, okay, that, that's another one of his great sins against society and against himself and against God. But uh, still the question is, how did we get there? And I, I'm gonna suggest what I know about, I've represented people in this, situation. I've been in family court and dealing with these kind of people. Um, typically, they don't start out killing somebody. They don't start out looking at, you know, snuff films where the person gets murdered while they're having sex. They don't start out that way. They start out with porn and soft porn even. They watch it, they, you know, it's so available on the internet so no, nothing stops them, and they think, oh, and it's kind of accepted by society. It's just private. It's my private pleasure. Leave me alone. And they look at it, and it gets interesting and exciting, and then they look at, they go a little deeper and a little deeper, and just like any addiction, it becomes that. It becomes an addiction, and now they start to cross the line because they're getting ecstasy from all of this, and there's nothing there to restrain them. They're all alone and they move on to, well, let me look at this. You know, it's curious, it's there, it's easy to find, child porn. And then they get in deeper and deeper. You, you could see the list of some of the child porn he was looking at. It got really, it's always sick, but it got really sick. And then they move over to the to, to torture and, and the ecstasy of pain. 
and they watch it. And at some point, after they've enjoyed that enough, they move on to trying it out. And that's how this happens. It's that steady progression. That I th that's a guess by me, but I've seen it in so many of the other cases where I do know if that's true, that I would say I could impose that judgment upon this case. And that's how he got to where he was, in my estimation. Now, um, one of the things you might want to consider, I don't know if you've thought about it, but I don't think you've heard it on TV yet, but um, <clears throat> I pull rank and say, I'm, from my experience again, uh, these people who, do, who get into child porn and dark web porn, they tend to have groups. They don't often march alone. They can, there are those who are, but there's plenty of them that they enter into groups. They start talking to one another over the internet, the people who are doing the same things, and they start to share experiences, and they start to actually they even trade pictures it's, done, it's a very common thing. They trade pictures, they trade stories, they meet, they sometimes find each other and fly and meet one another from other cities. It, they get that deeply involved, but they belong to groups. And you'll notice something about, about uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex. He was a group person. He liked to join groups. So the idea you know, that these people are all loners is not true. He was a grouper. He, in fact, we know from a woman who just complained publicly that she was a member of a social, I think, dating kind of group amongst architects and engineers. And they would actually meet. And she quit the group because he was so obtuse and so obnoxious. And she pointed out that he was gregarious in the group meetings. He would talk to everyone. And he would express himself constantly, never shut up. So, and, and that's, you can see there's, a, there's a something of the, of the unusual persuasiveness in that for how he would use that style and techniques to persuade some of these people to be where they were. But on the point, he was somebody who really liked to be in groups. Therefore, I, th I know the prosecutors now are going to be they're thinking ahead of me by far. They've already thought of this. But th 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 there's, there needs to be a tracing of exactly who he was co in contact with over the phone. He apparently used his regular cell phone to do the, uh, and, and his computer to do the sexual searching that he did. So it's, it, it wouldn't have been hard to trace that down. And it will not be hard. And you may be able to see there are groups. And if they are, then we'll know partially at least an answer to the question, are there other people involved in this? Because there very well might be in that way. So just a thought I had when, in studying this in the last few days. Sir, you had a question? Do right, you think there's any correlation between the city cop that was arrested two uh, weeks ago with the child porn? I wouldn't know. I, I couldn't answer that. I don't know. I mean, it could be, sure. I mean, but when they these guys they they you know they actually um they sell these things they, they actually sell the pictures and one of the interesting things is that i think today we found out the police were down in the basement and they were seen so the press was able to get some good shots they were seen counting money that he had in his basement cash so this guy living in this filthy hovel uh that was broken down and, and obviously, you know, a two by four holding up the porch. Right. Uh, <laughs> you, you know. He's an, he's an architect. Yeah, and he's an architect, so you know something's <laughs> up with that, right? Um, you know, you, you better, we, I'm going back and looking at my plans and my house now after that. It's, it's a, but uh, in any event, yeah, he, he's, he's looking, um, you know, they're looking at him, the, the, the police counting cash. So we had cash in the basement. Where'd that cash come from, right? You, you could say, well, you know, he, he does his, a lot of his work on you know, cash basis. That could be, but it could also be that he's getting that money from illicit sales of some of his uh, pictures and the, and the like. And if, if you don't know, if you, if you ever uh, encountered a snuff film, 
where the, the, the woman is being murdered. She actually is murdered on the film while she's having sex. Uh, those films in the dark web world are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay. Uh, they sell for that kind of thing. That's why they're so rare. You don't see them. But, um, but you know, was he at that stage? Was that where this money was coming from? It's a thought. I could be wrong about a lot of this, but it's a thought. So I've got questions already. So go ahead, ma'am. So I was in court on Friday. Uh, did I see you? Yeah. All right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's my understanding that in court it was mentioned that when these killings took place, that his wife was away. Yeah. It was my, also my understanding from what I read that his wife was about to take a trip to San Diego. Do you think, do you feel that maybe we need to jump on it quickly because he was planning another murder? It's a great, it's a great question. I mean, the answer is probably yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the girl that he chased around in the park wasn't that down? long ago. Yeah. Could, the lady, you couldn't hear the lady? No. no. Oh, I'm sorry. What she, she's saying is that, um, I'll repeat it for me again. Okay, so, you know, according to what was presented in court, it was said that these killings took place yeah, when his wife was away. Right. Um, and my understanding is that she was scheduled to go to Comic-Con in San Diego on July 20th. And I'm curious to know if... That's why the cops felt like with the last burner phone that he had, that maybe he was making calls and planning something for when she was going away. Could you hear her back there at all? No. Okay, so here, what she's saying is that the wife was planning to go to, away to a, a, a place in the West, Comic Con? Yes, uh, San Diego. San Diego. And uh, is, is that the reason why the police closed in? Because when she disappeared, he would be making another killing. And that's a, certainly a reasonable possibility. You know, the, the lady that that we heard complain that he chased her on her bicycle. That wasn't that long ago. So he's been very active. He, he didn't stop. So, you, so where are the other bodies? Well, there may be others uh, on Long Island, but he also had a home in Georgia. I'm sorry, in, um, uh, in, in Massachusetts, up in uh, North Reading, which is miles above Boston in the woods. Uh, he has a, a, a place, a, a condo of some kind, a fairly modest one from what I hear, in Las Vegas. And he had a place in South Carolina. The place in North Reading is a trailer, in a trailer park. He's also a hunter. And so, and he had 90 some odd guns. Whoa. So, that were kept in his basement apparently. So, I mean, you, you tell me the wife didn't notice that. I don't know. And that's but, why but, the police uh, arrested him at his office and not in his home because of the guns. I didn't know that. But that's, the lady says that yeah. that's why he was arrested at the office rather than at home because of the guns. Good point. But, sir, so you had a. Uh, is there any like update on like his state right now? Like, like in the last couple of days since then, since you saw him in court. Only that I heard rumors, uh, tips given, I don't know how valuable they are because so many of the tips in this case were useless. Uh, but tips that he is uh, possibly going to roll over and admit things. And that, that, by the way, that's not, a, you know, that could happen, why? Because he's pinned, I mean, he's trapped. The, the DNA and, and, the, and the cell phones, all that, have him so trapped that there's no escaping, you know, he, he, he's going to get the max. The only way out of the max for possibly would be to admit it or just because out of, he knows he's done anyway, he finally admits it and, and gets some of the guilt off his chest. Who knows? That has happened. We know Son of Sam, that worked, by the way. Yeah, and Donald too. Yeah, Donald, yeah. Wasn't there something recently that I heard on the news that Somebody was chased in Massapequa yeah. recently with him a couple of days ago. Yeah, that was that lady, I, I, I think, on the bicycle. She was yeah. chased through okay. the park. And do you get to go to his house? I haven't gone there, no. I, I, not, not yet, anyway. I probably might take a trip when, I, you know, when the time is right. But yeah, remember, I'm representing these two victims uh, and their, their families. And, you know, neither one of them are tied yet to this guy. Do you think he's on uh, suicide watch now? Don't know. I don't, the, 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 the police and the sheriff's office are very tight-lipped about that. He very likely will be held in isolation, uh, you know, during this time. He won't be put in the prison population. So. I saw a picture of a, on my, I'm from Massapequa, 
so I'm very interwoven. Mm -hmm. And I saw a picture of when he went to high school in 81 and his elementary school picture. But you know, he looked like a normal everyday kid. He might have been one at that time. It changed. Yeah. Could very well be. That he was not a normal kid. He was started out as a normal kid. I don't know. I don't know what a normal kid is, but. <laughs> I have a kid. He's right over here. Uh, sir, you had a question? Yeah, I have a question on the Chevy Avalanche. Uh, wouldn't that be in the DMV or a listing going back in times to who owns all of them out there? And why did it take so long to identify it? Yeah, the, the gentleman asked what about the, the avalanche. It, why did it take so long to use it as a piece yeah. of evidence when, it, when it's identifiable? Uh, you know, the, the pinging off the tower in Massapequa would have told you, or Massapequa Park would have told you that that's an area that you might want to have searched. Could you have put the two together and said, let's go and see how many avalanches are within, a say, a 10-mile radius? owned by anybody and will visit them one by one. Could, th could that have happened? Yeah. You know, my problem is, I don't, I, what I see before the task force, I see a lot of will neglect and some serious willful neglect by the, the police in this. And I don't want to make that the subject, the entire subject, as it's a big subject and I'm going to talk about it tonight in relation to Shannon. Uh, and that's a, that's a question that everybody's been asking. I, I don't have a good answer for it as a lawyer. I, I don't know how that w that could have happened. And also the camera for large burlap bag. I mean, that's not something that's sold locally. Couldn't they do a search on that? Yeah, it wasn't a, it was a certain kind of, uh, of uh, burlap. It wasn't the burlap that's used in landscaping. Right. So everybody thought Bissett did it. Right. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but Bissett, you know, he was, he was actually by uh, police chief Dominic Varone back in 2011, in the fall of 2011, Varone, the, the, the internet went so crazy saying it was Bissett because of the burlap and Bissett had committed suicide uh, right after the cops had visited him to ask, you know, to ask questions. So everybody said, aha, he's the guy. And... <clears throat> Her own held a press conference. How unusual was that? And the police said, he is not the guy. Before they knew anything about uh, how Shannon Gilbert disappeared. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, people make all these conclusions and they're not always there. But the other interesting thing is that I don't take Bissett off the hook um, yet because I've been able to connect Bissett with Oak Beach. And the police completely ignored that. But we were able to do it in my firm, and I'll tell you about how we did it in a moment. But before this is over, hopefully we have some time. Hold on, that's a lady all the way in the back, and then your turn, okay. Ma'am in the blue. You are correct. You, the, the police have said that Shannon died of a tragic accident. And I'm going to address that, as I said, as a part of this program. But I'm just going to sprinkle around and answer some questions first before we get to that, okay? Uh, it was you, ma'am. So, you had said about the ball being dropped, basically, from the Suffolk County Police Department, and right. then able to maybe tie Bissett in with them. There was a group that definitely had to have been a group with those Gilgo murders. And I think that they, in my opinion, Part of the ball was dropped listening to Dormer and other people discuss this, that a lot of people thought that James Burke was involved in it. Yep. And I think yeah. that's why yeah. there was a little yeah. bit of um, a policeman. neglect yeah. on the part of Suffolk yeah. County. Yeah, yeah. Did, could you hear back there? She says that that uh, the, 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 the evident, there was evidence that there were groups involved. Police. And, and that they might have been you know, connected with the police, and that was believed, uh, and maybe still believed, uh, because uh, of Chief Burke being involved in sexual activities and the like. Uh, so it's possible that Burke was involved in that. And we can't escape, that's a very uh, popular thing, thought, and popular because it's, it, it could have been very, and could be very well accurate. Uh, so, uh, you know, by no means is that washed out. You know, we don't want to say, oh, this is it, we got the right guy, that's it, it's over. 
not, not really, uh, not yet, by a long shot. Uh, this is just the beginning. So let, let me go back then, since you're all asking that question, and take you through uh, what, you know, I, I, I see a very knowledgeable audience already uh -huh. from the questions. <laughs> so uh, if I'm telling you things you've all already heard, uh, sorry. You know, uh, but but th th this is the this is the paradigm. This is the these are the parameters in which this thing or uh, this whole thing occurred. Okay, so I'll take you back to uh, when Shannon Gilbert's remains were found in I think it was December eighth of two thousand eleven uh, in the marsh. She was found laying face up with her head. More or less, she was on a, a slight angle and her head was on a bush. That's how she was found. Several days later, I was contacted by Mary Gilbert, the mother of Shannon, and a news reporter from the Daily News, a photographer named Steve Barcello. And he was a friend of Mary's. And what had happened was, if any of you remember the Medford murders in the pharmacy, yeah. yes. remember that? The yes. five people who were assassinated yes. by... Yeah. Laffer, James Laffer, right? Yeah. And uh, and his wife out in the car yeah. waiting for him. His father was my science teacher in high school. Oh. Is that right? Wow, oh, amazing. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about that later, it's an interesting thing. Well, I was retained in that case to come to the sentencing of Laffer and his wife, and presided over by Judge Jimmy Hudson, and uh, to speak on behalf of two of the children. Uh, and and their mother had been shot and, and you know, assassinated, just plugged her and that was it. Um, so I, the children didn't want to speak for themselves. They needed somebody, so I, I was the one that came in to speak for them. And what I did was, um, I'm trying to remember, they, I think one of them was in the audience, but they were little kids. And uh, one of them was actually maybe 12 or so at the time. So what I did is I channeled them I use the approach of channeling, uh, where I said, I am these girls when I spoke. I am not speaking about them or for them, I am. And I spoke about their Barbies, things like that, you know? And it was very effective. It, it, it rung home. And so um, after that, the, the, in the jury box sat the press, and Steve Barcello had watched it. So he approached me and he said, listen, I have a lady that could, you could help, Mary Gilbert. I wasn't paying attention to the case at that point. I didn't really, you know, I read the papers like everybody else, but it just went out of my mind. It wasn't my case. So I met her in a uh, restaurant, a bar in Islip with Barcelo. And we hit it off, we spoke, and Mary told me she had been, I saw her license plate when I walked in, and I said, the license plate said that she was a witch. And I said, are you really a witch? And she said, yes. She'd been practicing witchcraft for 22 years. And uh, it's kind of an interesting character. So we, 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 I got to know her pretty well, and we hit it off. And she said, listen, I'm only asking you to, because the police have completely botched this job. And they're so you know, poor at what they did that I need somebody to help me to speak for me and point this out. And the reason she said that was because several days be before Shannon was found, Police Commissioner Dorber of Suffolk County announced that she drowned. They hadn't found the body, but they announced that she went into the marsh and drowned. They did have no evidence whatsoever that she went into the marsh, but she drowned. So and it was absurd. And she, Mary pointed that out said, can you help us? So, and I said, okay, here's what you need to do. I said, we've got to get rid of the, the police and go to the FBI and get the FBI in because, first of all, they're wetlands. So I said, you, the FBI could have jurisdiction, the United States, over wetlands. Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, Shannon traveled from Jersey City, where she lived, mm -hmm. to Manhattan, out to Oak Beach. So she crossed state lines, yeah. federal offense. Okay, so we could get the U.S. Attorney and the FBI involved. So what I'll do is I'll call a press conference at Oak Beach and we'll, in January, and we'll ask for, we'll demand that the FBI come in. 
That's the only way to get this done. So that's what I did. And uh, we held the press conference in the cold there on that cold day. And that's what I asked for. I said, you know, the, I wrote a letter to the United States attorney and to the FBI and said, please come in to this case. The letters were, were never answered. And the FBI never called me and the FBI never came into the case. Nor did the police call me uh, at all when we made that request. And so I kind of would like to point that out because now, in January of this year, finally, the FBI did come in and look what happened. Okay? So uh, I, I, you know, I'm content with that point. But once I called that press conference, that created the problem. Because I was done. That was all I had to do. That was my job. I didn't get paid. And th that was the end of it. I thought. And two or three days later, I get a letter from a homicide detective investigating the case, uh, Detective Vincent Steffen. And he writes a two-page, single-spaced letter criticizing everything I said at the press conference. I admit that I, you know, I... I poked the police in the eye, I called them Pink Panther investigators, and then that, that dog was Inspector Clouseau. So, uh, that's what I did. So they were, they were pissed off, I get it. But I get this letter, oddly, on, on a, a, a police letter on Union stationery, not on county stationery. And he's writing about the investigation. And several days after that, he published that letter, he sent it to Newsday, and they put it in a feature and published the, the, the letter that he had wrote to me, just took my name off it. It was word for word what he wrote to me. Hmm. So, in other words, he created the narrative that guided the police department for the next 12 years. That, was, that letter contained the narrative. And in that letter, he said, he heard the tapes, I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm all wet, and he heard the tapes of Shannon's famous 23-minute call, and he, nobody was upset on that tape. Shannon was not in any danger. No, none of the other people there had any, were in any way you know, disturbed, and Shannon was acting irrationally, and that she ran into the marsh and had an unfortunate ending in the marsh by natural causes. <coughs> and that was their narrative for the next, as I said, the next uh, 12 years. The trouble with the press today is that the press is not like the investigatory press that some of you older folks remember when they were really tough about investigative work. And so the press kind of rolled over and said, oh, okay, that's what the cops say, I believe it, and that's all there is to it. You know, like the bumper sticker that you see the born again Christians with, Jesus said it, I believe it, and that's all there is to it. Well, that's how they were about the government. And, and, uh, and so nobody would do anything when they did that. But I knew that that letter couldn't possibly be correct. Uh, it, it just didn't follow, and we, and we didn't have the tape. We didn't know, the, you know what was on the tape. So I began to pursue the case. And basically what really happened is I was born an Irishman. And this guy insulted me. And he ridiculed me. And he pissed me off. <laughs> So I'm just being honest, I, just, I, I, I give you my word. I said, all right, you're not gonna get away with that. I'm gonna do something about that. And I stepped into the case. And since then I've been with it. I put in probably, we, we keep records, very careful records, time records. We put in over, somewhere between 30,000 and 50,000 hours of work in 12 years. And I, out of my pocket, I spent about $50,000 for transcripts and videos and the like and records. Um, to pursue this. So that guy pissed me off enough for me to almost wreck my career over that, but that's what happened. Um, and so I went to the autopsy meeting, and for the first time I ever saw it, and I'd been to autopsies before, the, the medical examiner's office is a civil agency. It's not a police agency. They're independent, supposedly. I've rarely seen them ever act really independently from the police. But this was the most blatant uh, mixture of them and the police. When we went into the, uh, uh, the meeting, and all the press was outside waiting, we went into the meeting, the chief medical examiner was there, she did not perform the uh, autopsy. The assistant 
Dr. Sim's child, she was there, and I brought my staff, and we brought the, the, the Gilbert family, and sitting in three chairs behind her and to her right were three homicide detectives sitting like this the whole time, and every time I asked a controversial question, she got out of her chair, walked over, whispered with them, came back and answered the question, oh. and said, I can't answer the question, or she'd answer it in her way. Oh my God. I've never seen that. And uh, th that's the way they handled it right from the start. You know something was wrong. I knew that. The trouble was I knew nothing about the case, so I didn't know how to ask the right questions, the really poignant ones that I'd be able to ask today. So a lot of this just happened, and that was the end of it. So from there, I said, wait a minute. They keep saying Shannon walked and got confused and lost in the marsh, and the drowning thing you know, quickly disappeared. And then they said, well, it was just some natural cause. She, she might have just, you know, she got exhausted trying to get out of the marsh. So I said, oh, this can't be. Let's find out ourselves. So I went and I took my lovely assistant and uh, who was about the same height and size as Shannon. And we went and we bought Vietnam era. We went to an Army Navy store. We bought Vietnam era clothes, fatigues, we bought robes. Because they told us that, you know, they said even her, her jeans came off because of the roughage in, in there and that there was quicksand and there were all kinds of animals that would bite you. So, you know, we got ready. We were in robes. We, we were afraid we'd go into quicksand. We'd have to employ, you know, it was like Hollywood. I, I had no idea. Right? So, so we, and what we did is we went to the site in the week of May the 1st uh, in 2012. And we waited till the, the weather mimicked the weather that Shannon would have experienced. You know, we mashed it up. And we went into the marsh ourselves with a guy who showed up to volunteer from uh, Greg McLaughlin, who was a, the cameraman and editor from 48 Hours. Uh, and they were already in the case because of the controversy with a guy named Peter Hackett, Dr. Hackett. So he came to meet me because I went with Barcelo, Barcelo told him to come and he showed up, I didn't know the guy, and we became close friends. But he, he walked with us into the marsh, and I thought that was pretty brave because it was, it was still a twilight when we went in, but um, you know, it, it looked dangerous, you couldn't get into the marsh. The police had indicated where they thought Shannon entered, and it was right near Hackett's house, next house over. So we went to where they said, and we went in, and getting in was not easy, because it's like a wall of thicket. But when you got in, finally, the thicket stopped, and the reeds were there, and then there was sort of a rise, and there were little flags. And the flags were where uh, Shannon had uh, her jeans, her pocketbook, her cell phone in her pocketbook, and I think a perfume cap uh, top, uh, were basically sprinkled around broadly in a circle just catty corner and right behind Peter Hackett's home. So we walked to Hackett's home and we were able to see that he had once maintained a walkway into the marsh and he still had the posts in the water, and the water was about that deep uh, by his house there. And uh, so he either recently, or we don't know when he took it down, but he had a, a method of entering that marsh. And you could have entered easily from that, that walkway in to the marsh. So we found that, and we found these, you know, where the, these things were, these other items were, and then we went from there and we walked towards where we thought she would end up. And we made sure that we went through, we always tried to follow where the reeds were not cut down from two years ago. The, you know, the police had cut down a lot of reeds with this machine. So we walked so that we would try to encounter her difficulty. And I can tell you this, when she made that phone call at 4.53 a.m., and that phone call lasted 23 minutes in total, there were two, phone, two, two uh, not one phone call, but uh, two tapes, 23 minutes, and then she had to run to Coletti's, knock on the door, then disappear, and about, six, about 5.30, she knocks on Barbara Brennan's door, and then she's never seen again, allegedly, okay? For her to go from Barbara Brennan's door, she'd have to go a little bit of a distance to get to Hackett, to the place where she would have entered the marsh. When you add up all that time, there's no way she could have gone in there 
before 5.30. No way. And at that time at 5.30, there's only 10 minutes more and dawn occurs. It's twilight. You could see. It wasn't pitch black. The police lied about that. They outright lied, and they lied again as late as May of this past year, uh, of last year, rather, sorry, May of last year, when they held a press conference on Friday the 13th at Suffolk County Community College and posted up the narrative as to why Shannon died of an accident. And they put up a picture of reeds where you could see the light, and behind the reeds was pitch blackness to say that she walked in the darkness and got confused and got lost. 48 hours was there, however, at that, and, and Gregory came out, and I found out that they closed the aperture of the camera so that the light that hit the reeds would make it completely dark in the background. They faked it. It wasn't real. We were there. We know what we, we encountered. And when we went in, you could see we didn't need a rope, you know, we, we, and, and by the way, we wore iridescent green boots. So how ridiculous we looked, you can imagine. Uh, you know, but we did that in case we got, you know, if we really got lost. And, and uh, we, as we walked along to our right, which was to the south, because we headed uh, eastward, you could see the houses along the, the drive there. And you could see people having their breakfast at the tables. And we, we were as far in as you could be. And you could still see that. So how hard would it have been for her to say, hey, I can get out of here? To the left, you could hear the cars going on the Ocean Parkway, the rubber tires, in the morning. And they, there was a, it was only about, from where she's found, it's about another 50 yards out, it, not even, out to the, the grass by the, by the uh, roadway. Admittedly, she had to get through some you know, bramble bushes, sticker bushes, but there, there were places where you could do that. Did you lose your pants? I, I did not lose my pants. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you can see how ridiculous this whole uh, event. And, and you know, look, I, so, so you see I wear some funny clothes, and uh, you know, I, I can get known for that with my hats and all, you know, but I've always been like that, that's just me. And um, that was one of the things that the police especially scorned because I didn't look right. I didn't look like a lawyer to them. Uh, and I certainly made them feel like that when they saw my outfit in the, in the marsh. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I've tried many, many, I've got, I'm a trial lawyer, I've tried many, many cases, I have a good reputation amongst the lawyers, and we weren't just making this up or frivolously trying to make a, a point with the press. I didn't even invite the press. They showed up because Barcelo brought them. Uh, anyway, we go through the marsh. We finally come to where she was. And you cross over mosquito canals. Mosquito canals everywhere we went had boards laid across them by people who had been in that marsh. So that's a well-traversed marsh by kids, you know, by hunters. Who knows by whom? But you could walk across these, so she, she wouldn't have drowned in the, in the canal. And even if she fell in the canal, the canal was only about, you know, this, this deep. It didn't go up over your boot in some cases. And the, other, the rest of the ground was loam, and it was just wet. So drowning was an absurdity on its face. If she f ended up face up, she didn't drown. And uh, how else could she have died of the you know, natural causes and not able to get out because she panicked. It was a lie. And I thought, well, a lot of these cops, they never really did take the trip we did, so maybe they don't understand what we now know, that this quicksand. couldn't have happened. No quicksand? No quicksand whatsoever. Um, you know, and I've been in there several times since, so that I've been in at different times of the year to see if maybe, I, you know, maybe that was, it was a dry season or something. And it was always the same. And, and that's true for years, ma'am. Did the coroner have a cause of death? The coroner, the, the, the coroner is, a, is a medical examiner in New York, and the medical examiner said that the cause was undetermined. Uh, the cause and the manner of death, both undetermined. So I, I can understand that because they, you know they didn't have they they didn't have solid evidence yet, but they did have, and and I think the doctor was a very young doctor who had just started out, and they had her do this work, 
they didn't take enough soil underneath the body. You know, you normally, they, they, they call it archaeology, but they take the soil and then they go through the soil to see, you know, were there bones that fell down there? Are there, you know, pieces of shavings or whatever? You know, they didn't do that in this case. They took a little bit, not enough. She also missed a very important thing that I noticed in the report when it was handed to me while the homicide boys were sitting there. And that was the hyoid bone. Mm -hmm. Anybody that deals with murder by strangulation or hanging knows that what happens in most cases of strangulation is that the hyoid bone breaks. It has some way, it fractures in some way. So if I'm squeezing you by the throat, the hyoid bone is up here. It's the only bone in the human body that's not attached to another bone. So for it to have any kind of fracture on it, you would really have to apply a lot of pressure. And, um, you know, th there's different people who say different kinds, of, you know, levels of pressure, but you would. That hyoid bone was recovered, and she had it as having a dent in the middle, in the base of the bone. The bone is a U-shaped bone, so you have a base and you have two horns with little horns sticking off of them. Those horns were missing, and there was a hole that was al almost perfectly round, not quite, that went right through the base of the bone from one side to the other, right? And it, it's unnatural for it to be there, that hole. When we examined the bones of myself and Dr. Bodden uh, later on, we saw that the, the horns were gone and one of the ends was fractured. So this was completely missed by Sim's child. Her report said that there was nothing more than a dent in the base of the bone. So I asked her about it. I saw that and said, what, what, how would a dent get in the bone like that? An odd dent. And the picture was so small you couldn't see that it was a hole. All right. And she said, oh, it, that could have been she had a growth in her throat and the growth you know, grew, grew into that. Okay, you know, fine. Until I saw the bone. And the bone was clearly a fractured bone and clearly had an unnatural hole. It was not a dent. It was a hole, a big hole. So all of this was missed. Fascinating, right? Yeah. And uh, anyway, we, you know, we went from there and we really began to pressure the police and say there's something wrong with this entire investigation and something needs to be done about it. And the more we said it, the more we were ignored. Uh, so this, the Dr. Hackett became a real controversy, as you know, separate from what I've just told you about, in that um, he, he emerges as a character in this in, when he calls Mary Gilbert on Monday, May 3rd, at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. He calls her, and she lives up in Ellenville, up in Ulster County. He's never seen her in his life. And he calls her and says, I am Peter Hackett, and I am a doctor and I have Shannon, I had Shannon uh, in my house and she was going to enter a home for wayward girls that I operate and I needed your consent. And she left with her driver and promised me she would come back and she didn't, so I'm worried about her. Do you know where she is? So Mary said, and, and Mary's the daughter, other daughter, Cherie, was there, so she heard this. It was confirmed. It wasn't Mary making it up, like they try to suggest. Okay? Mary said, why would you need my consent? My daughter's a full-grown woman. She's 24 years old. Why would you call me for my consent on this? He said, oh, we always get consent. We always get consent no matter what. And she asked, how did you get my number? And he, he said, oh, I, I got it from one of... Uh, uh, one of the boys that, that uh, had come to the house, and that was Pac, the driver, and Dia as the boyfriend. So that's how she, he, he, he covered this, in other words. So once that happened, Hackett became a person of interest, should have to the police. Don't think he did, but remember, he's the former Suffolk County police surgeon. Okay? And you say, well, that's just a, you know, a, t a titular head, right? Uh, you know, a nice little uh, political thing that was handed to him. But he was also the head of emergency medical services in Suffolk County. He had a real job for a while, got fired. And 
uh, as the police surgeon, when you as a cop had a disability claim, you went to Peter Hackett and you were good. So he had a function for the police department. And uh, he was crazy as a loon, but not so crazy in reality. His, his crazy lunacy is the cover. So he, what he does is he makes a call and I'll just fast forward to when I sued him uh, and that suit is still pending. Uh, I took his deposition three times. I also videotaped it. Um, and, you know, when I asked him about why he made the call, the first call, he said, oh, I just wanted to comfort her because she would have been upset. Mary Gilbert wouldn't have known her daughter was missing. He, she was only missing a day and a half. And she didn't live with her mother. So why, why would he do that? It made no sense. Except we then found out he also called the Ellenville police to s s find out what he could about Mary, about uh, Shannon. He also called the Jersey City police and spoke to Detective Cesar Camacho, who immediately suspected him of offing her and told me so. And he, he called everywhere you could call except the Suffolk County police. He did not call them. And on that day when he thought she, you know, she might have had a bad ending, he made no call to Suffolk County, his own police department. Later on, when I took his testimony, he told, uh, and these are all matters of public record, so I'm not speaking out of turn, he, he testified that he knew within a week after she disappeared, within the week after she disappeared, that she had died in the marsh. And his wife confirmed that. That was their collective uh, belief. So if they believe that, and he claimed that his mission testified my mission was to find Shannon. That's why I made these calls. And that's why I did all the things I did. Why then wouldn't he call anybody and say to them, I think she's dead in the marsh, which was his belief, he said. Why didn't he go up on the top of his house? I've been up there and stand in the deck that he has on the very top of his house that could take you directly down into the marsh and see what was going on in the marsh. If you thought she was dead in the marsh. Why did he do that? And uh, I might add that uh, the police, when they found Shannon's remains, to, you understand the sensitivity of the police department at that time. They brought Mary Gilbert up on Peter Hackett's deck to show her where her daughter was found. Okay, in the rain. And, uh, Anyway, I could, there's so many facts I could probably mm -hmm. ne never finish this whole discussion by telling you them all. But there were an enormous amount of facts. He, he claimed he never made another call, and he and his wife searched their records, their phone records, to see if they had you know, made a call and didn't remember it, and there were no such records. And then I produced for him the record that showed he made a call on Thursday, that Thursday, to Shannon at about 7 some odd at night. And he said, oh, I forgot that one too. But he had already searched his record, so had his wife. So his wife was in, in on it, in the cover-up, big time. And he couldn't explain it. And when I said, well, sir, you called, the phone pinged off of a tower in Hasbrook, New Jersey. So any of you take the bridge, going over there, you know Hasbrook is right in that area. So he, you know, somebody would have been either heading upstate to Ellenville, heading down to Jersey City, where she lived, or somewhere else, west. You could not ping that tower from New York. Cesar Camacho was a dyed-in-the-wool, missing persons detective from Jersey City, and he met with me for hours and told me that he was, had developed an expertise in that area, and it, there's no way, it was impossible to ping off that tower unless you were in New Jersey, in that area. So I asked Hackett, were you in New Jersey that night? He denied it. I said, how, how, how do you deny it? Here's the record. He said, I don't know. Um, he had kind of the same sneer, I might say, that uh, this, this uh, Rex has. So, where is Hackett now? 
He's in Fort Myers, Florida. All right, move down there. Anyway, to give you a flavor, I presented all this to the police department. I took innumerable hours of testimony, broke it down line by line and word by word into all the lies, over 300 documented self-contradictions, lies in Hackett's testimony, and his wife testified over 100 and some odd times, I don't recall. Even simple things like, where were you that night? Uh, I don't recall. So we had all this. I put it into a, a binder for the police to, to study, gave it to them, and they gave it back and refused to use it. And told uh, the, uh, my investigator at the time who delivered the papers to them, uh, you know, John Ray will solve this case over my dead body. The sergeant who told him that. Um, I've, met, I've met with that sergeant. That sergeant was, oh, and he also said, that's what it was. Uh, over my, I, he'll get the tapes, the 23 minute tape, over my dead body. That's what it was. And, and the nice part of the case was that when I finally won the lawsuit to get the tapes, two years of fighting in the lower court, then the appeal, and I won the appeal, and the only restriction was I wasn't allowed to use the tape, which is kind of an irony, right? But I got the tape. Uh, that police officer had to deliver them personally to me. <laughs> so, uh, and I said to him, the first thing I said to him, I said, hey, Sarge, you know, I'm nice to these guys. I don't, I don't, not mad at them, they're cops. They're, you know, they're helping us, right? And I said to him, hey, Sarge, you're alive. What's going on? <laughs> uh, he didn't appreciate the joke, but I did. Um, in any event, I got the tapes from him. Did you give that book to the FBI? Did that help them? Uh, we, we gave it to the, uh, we, we, we gave it first to the police. When they didn't take it, we told the FBI we had it, and they weren't active in the case, so they didn't need to use it. They told us that. They were not being consulted by Suffolk County. They were left out. But then when they did come into it, I mean... Did it help January. them? We didn't, and then once they only came into it in January, yeah. so we haven't we haven't seen them. On I I've been in a regular contact with them on DNA and also on searches that my my uh, team d does on the on the internet, and we've been able to give them information, uh, for example, about Fire Island Jane Doe and her identity. Uh, so we you know we've been helpful in that respect. But sir, didn't the FBI at one point get involved with uh, conducting a search? Suffolk DBA headquarters and taking records out of the Suffolk DBA headquarters in relation to this case? I, that's the first I've heard that. I, is that true? I didn't know that. T tell me about that later if you wouldn't mind. I didn't know that at all. But, ma'am? You said that the jurisdiction, when the marshals are there, would have been the FBI's jurisdiction. So we thought. So it wasn't? It, it could have been, but they were told to stand down. And, you know, they, these law enforcement agencies get along with one another. So what happened was when Burke gets appointed as the chief of, the, of detectives in January of 2012, just days after Shannon is found, the first thing he does is he shuts down the investigation. And they, they, they call off the investigation. So it, it, it dropped from January to March. And what the reason given was that well, you know, the cadaver dogs don't uh, like to be in the marsh in the winter. And that's what they said. And you can actually see it on TV, the speech that was made uh, uh, about that. And the truth was that apparently, from what I gather, I, you know, it's hearsay, but it's, it's pretty good hearsay, is that there's only one cadaver dog that was in the photo. We see all those dogs walking with those guys. There's one cadaver dog. The rest of them were props. And... and that cadaver dog was going to get upset about working in the winter time, so you know, he must be a lifeguard. I don't know, but uh, that—that's actually what they told us. So, uh, so then once Burke had shut it down and then picked it up, there's a lot of time for evidence to disappear. You know that one of the key pieces of evidence in Shannon's case disappeared, and I'll, I'll get your question, okay, in a minute. But uh, there was a jacket that she wore—a leather jacket. There was a jacket found in the driveway, a leather jacket, of Brewer's house. When Shannon's screaming, running away, you can picture that, you know, somebody's grabbing her, the jacket comes off, okay? The police found the jacket. When I was at the autopsy meeting, 
and we knew that they found the jacket. They had told Mary Gilbert they found the jacket. I asked him, why in the inventory you have here of things is there no jacket? They lost it. They lost the jacket. It had fingerprints. All right, so, I mean, how did that happen? I don't know. It, it happened. That's all I can tell you. I don't know what it means, but that happened. So, I mean, everything about this case had all of these markings on it. What do I mean? You know, uh, but, sir, you had a question. Do you think um, Hackett, with his prosthetic leg, could have actually made it into the marsh, possibly with a dead body, or actually pursuing someone and killed them out there and made it back out? Do you think that's possible? It's a good question, but there are people in Oak Beach who told us they had seen Hackett could actually run with that leg, and uh, although he was kind of heavy, so I don't think he would do that much. But he also spent a lot of time himself in the marsh. It seemed to be something he liked to do. And he would walk, instead of using the roadway in front of his house, when he wanted to walk down th that end of the neighborhood, he would go through the marsh to do so. So he was capable of it. He's a big man. He was as big as, as uh, Rex. And uh, same description, by the way. I know it was they interesting. Seem, they seem uh, the yeah, they seem the same. But, but he also, I mean, that's just a coincidence, but uh, he, he also, um, what, I had to point out to Detective Byra, the chief of detectives, when he came to see me, finally, um, that you know, how could they get all the way through the marsh and have Shannon end up way, way far? Why would anybody drag her way over there to where she was? Well, first of all, if you look at the, mar uh, the map and the marsh, you would see that if you were going to place somebody in the furthest point you could where nobody could smell her or see her, that's the spot she was in. And how would she get there? Well, when I went in to what? I went in several years later, like two years ago, two, two or three years ago, I went in there two years ago. I went into the marsh again, and we cut, you know, we started to cut our way in around where Shannon was found. And, you know, there's sticker bushes. You gotta cut your way through it, unless you wanna really work at it. We found a skiff that was all covered over. It's and it's just a, a small boat, all right? And, uh, it was all covered over. It was near where a house had once been, a foundation of a house. Uh, and it, I realized, I said, this is probably not the boat, but if you wanted to, you could carry that body through the mosquito canals right to where she was, almost. You only have to walk a few feet. So it was perfectly possible to carry her to where she was. Doesn't mean that happened, you understand? But there are, you know, these are not impossibilities. Ma'am? Um, I was watching the killing season they would have, you know, they'd all get together or whatever, and they said law enforcement was there, and they were all buddies. Were they able, ever able to connect Burke to Hackett? Yes, we connected Burke to Hackett in two ways. First, an eyewitness former detective said that he saw Burke and Hackett walking across the floor at a police function together uh, <clears throat> across the dance floor when he was there. That's subjective testimony for sure. Maybe the guy had an interest in saying so, I don't know. But Hackett claimed at his deposition and in the newspapers when he had the job back in the 90s. <coughs> Excuse me. Can we get a drink of water? <coughs> Sorry. Hackett claimed that he went to, and he did, he went to the recovery site when Flight 800 crashed. And he was helping, to re, helping the medical examiner to recover body parts, he claimed. He also claimed, and you can see it in Newsday if you ever want to look it up, he claimed that um, at that time he was obese, and, and he's one leg, that the uh, Coast Guard took him up in a helicopter, flew him out over the, the, the bay, and he rappelled down onto the, uh, uh, the deck of a yacht, swam through the flames, and recovered body parts. He actually says this in Newsday. Okay? So, you, you, you see what we're dealing with here? And that's the cover, because he looks so absurd. The police said, he can't be a killer. Look at, he's nuts. All right? That's what they said. But it's a good cover. All right? So he claimed that he recovered body parts. And... Uh, in fact, when he testified, he claimed that when I said I confronted him with that, he said, "No, that that was all made up by the Newsday reporter. She lied, all right." But he was walking along the shore, 
and he saw a, a, a seat, an airplane seat, float up with fingers stuck in the seat. And he recovered that. And I said, how did you know that it would have fingers in the seat? And he said, well, when I was younger, I was driving down Rockaway Boulevard, and uh, I saw that the crash that took place at Kennedy. There was some crash, I yeah. remember. Yeah. Yeah, the 9-11. A long time ago, right? Yeah, but he, right after, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so he claimed he, he, he went there when he saw the crash and went and helped it. And he knew from that experience that fingers are found inside of, of uh, this right. absurdity. By the way, he had a predilection with fingers. And Shannon's uh, left hand is missing all but one of its fingers. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. But... That, that was how I digressed. I know I keep doing that, but but actually, that's how he claimed he was there. I recovered a diary of a woman who sat with Hackett, who was there to help with the recovery, and she sat with Hackett on a park bench for three days, and all he did was hit on her and talk her up, and she said so in her diary. Um, but why does that matter with Burke, which was your question? It matters because at Burke's sentencing, Burke's Lawyers presented an 80 some odd page, um, you know, document filled with people saying what a wonderful guy he was. You know, the kind of thing you do at sentencing. It's, it's normal to do that. And his greatest accomplishment, he says in those papers, was his work at the recovery site of Flight 800. So they had to know each other. There was a small, the medical examiner's office, a tiny group of people, and Hackett was there as the. Uh, you know, the police surgeon and the chief medic, uh, emergency medical services, he had to know, you know, we, we don't have them actually talk to each other, but it would be impossible for them not to know each other. So there's that. Sir, all the way back. If you cut to the chase, what is the task force going to do with all this, in your estimation? Are they going to continue to appeal the onion? Uh, it's, it, it's, you know, yeah, that does cut to the chase because we... That's what we're hoping will happen. Uh, we want to get a second shot at uh, this because the police have concluded what I said. We are, we're going to be asking the task force to reopen this and look at the new evidence. Since the time that I'm talking about to you, which is kind of old, uh, many things have happened. We've gotten a lot more evidence. My, I have a small office and we have a room just filled with pockets on Gilbert and, Hack, and uh, uh, Gilgo Beach. <coughs> um, we have new evidence. I'm not going to tell you what it is here tonight. We were originally going to call a meeting and then reveal it. Now, with this new development, maybe we're not going to do that anymore, but I want to really open the door and keep cooperating with the task force. So we have evidence dealing with the 23-minute tape and the circumstances of her flight that morning to be able to hopefully convince the police that, uh, not just the police, but the task force, that they need to reopen this and look at it. The evidence is pretty dramatic. And in addition to that evidence, <coughs> excuse me, um, we have uh, uh, Dr. Biden on Fox TV on Friday night saying, not that uh, the uh, break is consistent with homicide, which is what he originally said years ago. He said it was murder, unconditionally. And he's the most renowned medical examiner in the world. So uh, that's pretty good evidence so far. And we're going to ask them to do that. Well, I, don't, I don't have high hopes, though, because you know we've been put down so often on this. No matter what we showed them or did, as you can tell, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical, but I have a good relationship with Ray Tierney, always did, when he was in the DA's office as a young man, and then when he went on to become a, a, an assistant United States attorney, he and I, I, I came to him with a case that I had investigated, so you see that I'm not, you know, just a you know, wild card out there. I investigated the case of Vincent J. Charmarco Jr., who was an attorney in Smithtown, um, and I, you know, I took on the case of the little girl that he stole $1.2 million, $1 million from, uh, an inheritance that she had. And I investigated it, I chased down all of the 
you know, the documents, and, and I spent three weeks sitting in a house in Sweden just going through this until we got it right. We presented it to the court, and um, the court wasn't, will nobody was willing to do anything about this very well politically connected lawyer, so, including the district attorney. So we went and took the entire motion that I had made and the investigation I had done, and we turned it over to Ray Tierney. He prosecuted that. He dro drove that forward. So he knows he has regard for my work in, in investigations, and I have regard for him as a, as a prosecutor. So, I'm, you know, we're friends. Uh, Rodney, the same thing. Uh, Rodney called me and said, look, we want to start all over. We want a new relationship. And, you know, we're willing to listen to what you had at that point. This was before I had what I just told you. So right after Rodney came into office. One of the first things he did. So he came to my, invited him to my office. He came with some cops. And uh, we talked. And that's when he announced that he was going to release the tapes unconditionally. And so I have a good relationship with him. I just saw him the other day, you know, I'm still playing lacrosse. He get, he's interested, he's gonna to come to one of my games. And uh, so we become friends. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, good relationships we can keep by going to them with this evidence and saying, hey, fellas, come on, really look at this in, a, in the right light. But, you know, he had promised that he would get new eyes into this case. And some of the cops that are on this are not new eyes. So that's a problem. About what set Shannon off in Brewer's house, and where did Hackey come in then? Shannon had the reasonable belief, I can say unequivocally, the reasonable belief, not the drugged up belief that was inferred. Uh, or bipolar. You know, a bipolar, right. She was never diagnosed with, with she, she, people said she was bipolar. Her, her, her friend said she was bipolar. Her, yeah, yeah, but but you know it's like the drowning kind of thing. There's no. We checked hospitals. She was never checked in for any kind of bipolar disorder. We checked in New Jersey where she lived and all around Hackensack and so on. Okay, so that that wasn't really accurate. But she rationally had this belief. She, how many have ever heard of an escort, a sex worker who's doing illegal things for a living? Call nine one one. That's pretty extreme. Okay, so something's up. And what she says right away, you know from that tape what's up. She says they're trying to kill me. And she repeats that and repeats that and they did that. on the tape. I mean, so what do you do? If you're in her position, outside, are there, there are people outside, either on the deck or right near the house of Brewer, right in the darkness. It's 4.53 a.m. Inside is Shannon and Brewer, who's upstairs, he says, and then comes down, and Pack enters at one point. But she's already called 911 before either of them show up on the scene. Why? Because if she goes outside, she's going to get killed, she thinks. And if she stays inside, they're going to come in and get her. So she has a Sophie's choice. And she makes the right call. She bolts out of the house. And of course, she gets accosted, and you hear the blood curdling screams. Stunning. Screams that both Brewer and, ha and Pack had originally denied ever occurred, and that the police department said never occurred in writing. And I finally had the chief of detectives admit to me that the police gave a false story in that letter, and he doesn't know why. So, we're, that's what she was doing that night. And all of that makes a lot of sense. And we have other things that I just said, I'm not gonna discuss them now, but that regarding those tapes. When she runs, she goes exactly where she should do. You hear her knocking on doors. When she gets to Coletti's door, Coletti doesn't greet her the way, it's, four, you know, it's five o'clock in the morning. He doesn't greet her and, and say, hey, you know, what's up, are you okay? You know, is, 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 you know, is everything all right? You know, do you want to come in? He doesn't say any of those things. He accosts her with a very weird statement. Like, you better watch yourself. You better watch out or something along, along those lines. Uh, I'm told in, in uh, you know, in mafia circles, that's the phrase you use when you want to tell somebody they're in trouble. Okay? That's how he confronted her. And he says, 
twice on two videos. You can see him yourselves anytime you want. And he's kind of cocky about it. He's, he's, uh, you know, he's having a good time being in front of the press. And he is the best friend of Peter Hackett. Mm -hmm. When Shannon's bones are found, police go looking for Hackett, and he's found at Coletti's house. Okay, and he said to a reporter in New Jersey, to the Star Ledger, he said, "You can ask me anything you want, but don't ask me to give up my friends." Okay. That's, that's the Coletti we dealt with. I met Gus. Gus told me a story, a narrative about what happened. He told me that morning I went into the marsh. I was up on his deck. He told me that story again, and the two stories contradicted each other. Then he told two more stories to the press that completely contradicted what he told me. And not just in the little details that people forget because they're old and so on. All right? Uh, no. He outright lied. And he lied repeatedly. He says, and you'll see him saying, she was calling, help me, help me, help me, help me. Four times he yells it out, that she was calling out. Listen to the 23-minute tape. You can hear it. I heard Show it. me where she says, help me, help me, help me, help me. And you hear her knock, and you hear him answer. She never said it. Why does he say that happened? A little detail? He also claimed that he invited her into the house and she came in. Listen to the tape. He never invited her into the house and she never went in. She left right away. And there's a darn good reason she left right away. But I'm not going to tell you why yet. All right? Because that I'm holding for that time when I do. I'm going to present that evidence to the, the uh, task force first and see how, what they think of it. Okay, she did exactly what anybody would have done. She ran right away from Coletti in his house. She did the right thing. So that's there as well. That's in this case. So this has all been ignored, and except by me and a few others, and we're, I'm not going to ignore it. We're going to keep at it until it's over. But uh, you were first, you were second. Okay, so sorry to go back to Rex. You said that all his stuff he did was on his phone, right? They could get records from 13 years ago? No, no. The records, uh, it's very hard to get records from 13 years ago. Most of them are wiped out. We've tried ourselves to get records, and we've been, you know, by, from Verizon and all these other places. And very often, the records are sold uh, a long time ago to, you know, like, we, we trace some records to Canada, and then from Canada to California, and then they're gone. So not necessarily can you get them. So then how do they know, I was going to say, if they found stuff on his phone, then they could find stuff on these guys' phones from that time too, right? The you, you would hope. But I, you know, I have no faith that they, they waited too long. Mm. That's, that's I'm, as far as I can see anyway. You, yeah. Should we be thinking that Rex is responsible for all of this? Yeah, that's you know? a great question. I, you know, there are people who say that modus operandi is very different between the two sets, the four, you know, the Gilgo four and everybody else who gets dismembered and so forth. But remember what I said to you early on, do you remember? Group groups. Groups, and what else? He's a hunter. Hunter, he's a proficient hunter. He had 90 some odd guns, all right? Hunters, when they kill their game, they take it home and they cut it up, don't they? Yeah. All right? So he had the tools to do that, and he had the wherewithal to do that. It's not easy to cut up a human body. I've had several cases involving it. It takes real, not skill, but you have to have, it takes strength, and it takes, um, it ta takes some experience. You gotta know what you're doing. You just don't, you know, that's not easy. And so, but a hunter could do that. So he's perfectly capable of doing that. And it's not necessarily true that so-called serial killers are um, automatically going to always use the same methods. Over the years, they often change their methods. So I'm not convinced that he's not. I think there's a good chance he might be the killer of the others, and we'll have to see. Is there any but that's my view. But but there was another lady that I didn't. But you, let me get that lady first. Okay. So is there any connection of Hackett or anybody else being on the dark web, and maybe they were in similar groups together? So there is this interconnect. With Rex else? It's a good question. We're looking at that as you speak. We're starting to look to see if there's any connection. We don't know. Uh, and we don't have any dark web uh, access. You know, that stuff goes away real fast. Uh, so, you know, 
we just don't have it. And, you know, we always had in my, my staff a reluctance to dive into that because <laughs> next thing you know, they're calling you up and they're arresting you. you know? So it's, touch, it's a touchy thing. It's pretty horrible to look at. You know, so that, that's, that, I don't know how to answer that other than that. You know, but good question. There was, I know you had another one. Yeah. Go ahead. So tonight on TV, the New York State Police gave a press conference. And they said that they were not asked previously to be part of the task, the investigation. They were asked to be January of last year part of the task force. That was the first time they were brought into it. And he pretty much said it was his investigator, not the stuff that, they worked in tandem and they were together. But the New York State Police investigator was the one that tied all this together and got their, um, they made no mention of the FBI being involved in it, but I guess there are fresh eyes in there. Well, that's a good point. And I, I heard that story and it's probably true. Uh, you know, there's a combination of these people. So let me tell you a little bit about the state police. When Shannon called, her call went to Suffolk County, 911. Right. They immediately, within a minute or two, transferred it to the state police because the Ocean Parkway is their jurisdiction. Okay? So that's why it's 23 minutes. It's 21 plus the two. Okay? Uh, so the state police got it. When I sued and I demanded uh, from from Suffolk County that they produced the tapes. I also demanded it from the state police. The state police said, we'll be happy to give it to you, uh, our, you know, theirs, but uh, we are only going to obey Suffolk County. We'll do whatever they do. And Suffolk County said, gave me the, you know, so, uh, so I had to fight Suffolk County. And, and you know, you only have so much resource. I'm not going to fight the state in Suffolk County when I can do this by fighting one of them instead of two. So I fought Suffolk County. When we finally, when, Sergeant Portella finally delivered the tapes to me at my office uh, on a, I think it was a, I forget it was a Sunday or whatever it was a Sunday morning. So he they, I guess they figured I'm a good boy and I must have been at mass. I don't know, but uh, they, I think they were hoping I wasn't there. But I heard about it immediately from one of the neighbors. He's there, and I zoomed over. I'm only three minutes away. You know, if I drive that 80 miles an hour, and <laughs> and I got there, and there he was. So he had to give me the tapes, and uh, but I asked him. I said, Sarge, I got a court order that you turn over the transcript of the tapes as well as any of the notes that you took on this. Where are they? He said, We never did one. They never did. I mean, here's this tape with a girl blood curling, curling screams, and they never did a transcript. Something very fundamental. They never did one. I said, did you, did you have any notes on voice enhancements? We never did one. So they were relying on my transcript in, the testimony, in, their, in their fight with me in the court. And they said over and over in court, we're not giving up the tape. They, the police, are not giving up the tape because it's an open and active investigation. And in this, I would argue to the court and say, how could it be an open and active investigation when they said it was an accident and it was closed? It can't be both. That's why I won. Okay? And with all, when he brought me the tape, I said, is this the original? He said, no. I said, well, you know, what, what is it? He said, it's a copy. I said, well, do you have the original? He said, no. I said, where is it? He said, the state police have always had it. <laughs> so the Suffolk County Police misrepresented to the courts repeatedly that they were covering up this, they, they were keeping this tape for an open and active investigation. They never had the tape. S the state police had the tape, he said. So we then went to the state police and said, hey, guys, give us the tape. And the, the state police said, we don't have it anymore. We don't know where it is. Oh, so the original is gone. <laughs> okay? And that's what we're dealing with. So that's a, so this, by the way, so then it brings it to the state police. When Burke came in, and and they the Suffolk County Police decided that they weren't they didn't want any cooperation from any other agency, they shut off the FBI after they used their helicopter to fly over and they bragged about that, um, and and saw nothing. All right, so they gave up the, the FBI, but they also told to stand down 
uh, Cesar Camacho from the Jersey City Missing Persons Bureau. He was investigating the case actively. He was in hot pursuit of Hackett, and they told him to stand down. I met him, and he told me that. Okay? They told the Nassau County police to back off. The two of the bodies are found over the Nassau County line. Okay, Peaches and forget the other one now, but um, the the uh, the detective sergeant in charge of homicide uh, from Nassau County for many years was Danny Severin, and Danny and I also played semi-pro football. You know, if you look like you say this guy played football, yeah, I was 210 pounds and I used to lift it all that when I was a kid, you know. So, uh, you know, before I had a brain. And, and, and I, so I played with him with the, on the Long Island Giants. And so I knew Danny and I called him. And uh, uh, Danny told me, yeah, they, 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 you know, as far as he knew, the, Suffolk, the Nassau County Police were told, hands off, Suffolk County's handling this. State Police, same thing. So all those different agencies were told, get away, and Suffolk County isolated itself. That's why nothing got done. Didn't I tell you that I played football already? I'm sorry. When, when, when I brought Michael Bodden in to uh, uh, the case back in 2016, I knew Michael. He had been once for about a, two years, he had been the Suffolk County Medical Examiner back when I was a young man and doing cases. So I knew him. He knew of me, he didn't know me well, except his brother Bobby who worked with him in doing all the dissections and so on, and, and Bobby was a big guy with long hair down to here, he would work with uh, Michael, and, uh, and uh, Bobby also played with me semi-professional football. So I knew him, he knew me, and I was able to convince Michael Biden to come and do this pro bono. And that's how he got into it. Uh, so when he saw the, you know, the, the uh, hyoid bone and so on. So I, I don't know if I digress too much there, but that, that really happens. You know, that's how things really work, you know. Uh, but, go ahead. Jessica Taylor, Manorville connection, not John Zitroff, because why, why wouldn't you think, like, what would eliminate him as a suspect? Because he's already serving two 50-year-to-life sentences, and maybe they don't want to spend the money to investigate him. One police officer, Suffolk County police officer, said officer said about a year ago uh, that in 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 the case, by the way, uh, he said that he's wait. They're waiting for Bitroff's time to run out, and as soon as it does, they're going to go talk to him. So he was suggesting, inferring that they still believe Bitroff is is responsible. That's one opinion, but you can't take it at face value, and. Uh, uh, I met with the Bitroff family, so I, I know from them what they thought about the case. They wanted me to take it. I didn't. Um, but uh, the appeal, that is. Not, not the trial, but the appeal. Um, but the interesting thing about Bitroff, if you believe the hearsay, is that Coletti, n nice guy, just an old fisherman who's on his way to a nice little you know, uh, car show up in upstate somewhere. That's why he's up early in the morning, he said. Uh, Coletti also was an illegal um, fireworks dealer, and big time. And his garage was stuffed with fireworks. His garage exploded and at, at some point, and he had to have it rebuilt. And we were told that Bitroff rebuilt it. So it's kind of an interesting connection to Oak Beach. Uh, with with uh, Bissett, you wanted me to know, I was going to tell you about the connection. Well, uh, when I took the deposition of Thomas Canning, uh, Thomas Canning was the, the, the very close friend of Hackett and of uh, Coletti. They were like this little knit circle. They all lived right near each other. Okay, Canning was a landscaper, and uh, his his exclusive cli his clients were exclusively Oak Beach, and the rest of the time he sat on the curb and drink beer. So uh, that, that's who he was. And during his, his deposition, he blurted out to me, I didn't ask him, he blurted out that he was really angry at Bissett because he would buy, uh, Kenny would buy his, his uh, wholesale 
items from Bissett and use them. But here's Bissett, the biggest wholesaler in this whole part of the island with two big you know, sites for that. Do you, any of you are in business, do you compete with your own retailers that you're selling to? Who would do that, right? So Canning was pissed off because Bissett would service, personally service, the landscaping of Sal Aversano's house. His house adjoined Barbara Brennan's and was right across the street from Thomas Canning. Sal Aversano's kid died of an overdose of heroin. He was the closest friend of Charlie Hackett, Peter's son, and uh, Justin Hackett, uh, uh, Justin uh, Canning, who also got busted for heroin in New Jersey. Sal Aversano's house was serviced by Bissett, and that ticked off Canning, and he wouldn't forgive uh, Bissett for that, and he told me so. So why would this wholesaler be helping out in, of all places in the island, Oak Beach, right next to where this whole scene is? I mean, it's a fascinating coincidence, right? You know? So you got a book full of stuff tonight, right, that you can go home? I mean, you know, I'm not writing the book. I'm working. That's what I'm doing. But, uh, sir, in the back. Why was Shannon's uh, cause of death not determined? Uh, the medical examiner claimed that uh, there was no evidence of the cause itself, of the manner or cause. All you have were bones. And there was, she, she ignored it. She missed the hyoid completely. And she otherwise, they did a, a test of her hair, they, she had a man of hair left, they tested that, and it came back negative for any drugs. So that's kind of interesting because we know that, that escorts typically do drugs with their clients, and her boyfriend said, oh yeah, she would do drugs with, you know, if the client asked her, she would do drugs. Uh, but, you know, if they didn't, she didn't. We checked around if she ever had a drug addiction problem in, in the whole neighborhood where she lived and so on. There was never any evidence of it. The hair coming back would never have told you what drug, if any, she ingested that night. That night. It wouldn't have gotten there by that time. But it would tell you if she was, you know, say, using cocaine or, or heroin or something like that. It would be in her hair. There was none. Any alcohol? Uh, I don't know. You know, they, I don't know if they even tested for that. I've forgotten. But I, I, I didn't see anything like that. They could have done a diatomaceous test on her bones to see whether or not she drowned. I think they refused to do it because it was too expensive and absurd. Um, but outside of that, we don't know what else happened to her. There's just no way to know from what they saw. Yeah. Ma'am? Regarding the hyoid bone, I understand the, the fracture. Would, would breaking that bone result in that almost perfectly shaped hole you mentioned at the base of the bone? Or what would what that? It's a great question. I don't know. I mean, the, the bone, the, the, the um, one wing of the bone is broken on its top. Mm -hmm. The hole is in the base. They're not connected. Could there have been something that connected them? Yeah. But it's, I, you know, we, we surmise that it's a, a needle or a, you know, big needle or a drill or, a, you know, something nailed in there. Something put that hole there. And it was, animals didn't eat through that. There's just no, you know, there's no evidence of that whatsoever. So, all the way in the back, and then you, have it next, okay? Yes, yes. Dr. Sims, when I pointed that out, said, what, where's the fingers? She said, oh, little animals took them. That's what she said. No, that, that's possibly true. I, they munch on them or something. You know, I don't know. But why didn't they take the other ones? And the tell, you know, why did they take all the other little balls? Why did they take the hyoid ball? That had you know, gristle on it. I don't know. And ma'am, you were next. What about the other side of the hyoid The other side looked, uh, it, it was rounded. But the, on each bone, there's also another horn that grows out from the bone. So if you picture it like that, there's a little horn that comes out here, a little horn that comes out there. They were both missing. But there was no fracture? Or but the, we, we didn't see a fracture on the other side. Or hole. The hole was only in the center. Uh, any other questions? Uh, okay, ma'am, then you, okay. 
now on the other side, do you think his wife had anything to do, his first wife had anything to do with it? Do you, you, you mean, uh, Hackett, Hackett. you talk about Hackett or are you talking about um, the uh, one who Rex? Was, Rex. Okay. He, he was divorced from his first wife. Do you think she had anything to do with it? I have it? no idea whether, she, whether his first wife had anything to do with it. That's what she asked. Uh, I, I have no idea. I mean, there's no way to know yet. I'm sure there'll be a lot of a lot more. You're going to be involved. This case is going to. I, I'm never going to get off the phone. I can just see. It, you know. <laughs> 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 the new thing that they had a helicopter in Massapequa was searching some storage unit in Amity. There's two storage units, yeah. Yeah. and and uh, they they were across from each other. Right in Amityville. Or in Amityville, yes. Uh, which you know is interesting, but uh, you know we don't know what they found there yet. There was a lot of wood, from what I understand, it was big piles of wood, because he was a carpenter now, as I well. Now I have one other quick question. He did interviews many years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It was not smart. Nobody ever caught on to him then. Well, remember what he likes to do. When he called Melissa Bartholomew's sister, and the first question he asked her using Melissa's phone was, are you a half-breed like your sister? Okay, and then he went on to more filthy and horrible things that I won't express here. Okay, but he talked, he described how she died and how he enjoyed watching her and how he enjoyed driving by her uh, or, or being by her, you know, where she was buried. He, he told her all those things. So this is a man who has a delight in, in taunting. This, you know, you, we know that, the, that these kind of people, they take trophies like fingers. Okay, like earrings, things of that nature. Um, what trophies did this man take? Well, the whole, you know, he wrapped them up like mummies that we do know, that we've seen. So he took, God knows what trophies from them, you know, jewelry or whatever, who knows. But I say he takes, he's a very smart man. And, you know, street smart, but smart. Uh, he took metaphysical trophies. And the metaphysical trophies, obviously not physical, they were the, the brothers and sisters and mothers and so on of the dead. He searched them out, as we all know, and he investigated them and tried to find out everything he could about them, according to the police, right now. And, and uh, he collected this information. Those were his trophies. It gave him pleasure to do that, and he taunted them. He was planning to taunt them, or he was taunting them. He's that kind of a guy. So, I guess that answers it. I, I'm thinking, but let's I go. I can't he's done killing. It's 13 years and he hasn't killed anybody else. That doesn't sound. It, it sure doesn't, sir. I think maybe like he wanted to get caught and he left that trail like that because, you know, he has all these things that he did, but now he wants to be known for what he did. They always do. Yeah, yeah. exactly. They want the notoriety, they want the infamy. Yeah, it's kind of, they have this that dichotomy. On the one hand, they have to hide from getting arrested. On the other hand, they delight in the inferences that are out there. You know, they, they taunt you with little facts and tell you little things they know, but not quite enough for you to do anything about it. That's what's going on in that man's brain, that, as it does for many of them. I've got another 10 minutes, so I'll keep taking questions, and then I'll just wrap it up real fast, okay? Ma'am, you were, I didn't I thought if you spoke yet. Um, we don't know if he killed more than the three, perhaps four. Um, but my thing is, uh, I've been really following this, and I'm thinking to myself, when he turns around and um, taunts these people, do you know if he's taunted other families too? Other victims? We don't know yet um, whether he has or not, but... Um, there's a real strong possibility of that. You know, we're looking into phone calls that he's made to other people as well as we speak. So I don't know, but I'm sure there's got to be something like that out there. Uh, I, I, <laughs> go ahead. Has the infamous belt been linked to this animal, T Rex? Well, you can through the, the Hoyerman or Hurerman. Hur Hur means strong. So Hurerman is a strong man, H M. It could be. Uh, I talked to a, a woman I got to know through this case 
Forget, let me tell you something. I have boxes, <laughs> boxes, right? I mean, boxes of, you know, we, we print out everything. So if people who call me, you know, everybody says, it's my husband. I'm telling you, it's my ex-husband. <laughs> He's the one, you know? <laughs> my understanding that his, his grandfather and his uncle were named William. So W-H. W-H could be in there. Yeah, there could be a few. Yeah. But, but so you get to know all these people who call up and they give you tips and so forth. And I treat them all, you know, I'm not a saint, but I, I feel like they deserve the dignity of, their, of their, you know, being treated right because they're taking the time to put the time in to talk to me. So I always listen no matter what. And sometimes when they keep going on, I have to close it down. But um, we all, so we have a boxes and boxes of these things of people we've made notes on or, you know, we have their emails. And one of them was a, a sadomasochist model. And she claimed that she knew, she had met Peter Hackett and uh, in New York City, she thought. She thought it was him. So she gave me a lot of information. So the more she started to tell me, I asked her about, you know, her little hobby that she was into. And she said, oh, I have the belt. It's easy to explain. She said, what happens is it's a belt. One thing that uh, Geraldine Hart told us was that it was a belt for a very large man. She thought. She didn't give us anything else, so it was completely tantalizing nothing. It was it was an, almost an insult to the public what they did when they released the, the initials on the belt. Uh, but it, they said it was a very large man <clears throat> belt. So that would fit this guy, but the belt was even larger than he was, and uh, supposedly. So what she said was that when you're into this kind of thing, they typically get, they use toys, and one of the things they use is they use things to, to bind you, to, to, you know, hold you. So they, they have belts. And if you're really into it, like she was, they typically put initials or a crest of a family crest on there or some other device. They identify their, to, their toys and their tools and take pride in it. So we know that belt was used to wrap up one of the girls, right? And... <clears throat> It makes sense, therefore, that that conforms with what I learned from this lady uh, about how a belt would. Th th those initials have meaning, you know. Th are they human or human? Or human? I don't know, but they, there is an H and M there, right? So uh, they, they also. I was able to. There's a lot of combinations you could find, but you know, uh, um, I don't know. It's hard to know. So. Is there any sort of connection we think between the? kid they found on the southern state and yeah. the rest of them or was it i haven't heard that <coughs> she's asked about a kid they found on southern state a couple, uh, a couple of days ago oh, like the day before the yeah there were a lot of people like uh, paul morrow who's a former uh, head of the anti-terrorist task force he's a very good friend of mine we, we became friends on another case fascinating case um and he was on tv talking about this and he speculated that they were connected but that was too early. I don't know if they're, they're connected or not. Um, uh, <clears throat> so that was Paul, but I don't, I, I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, yeah. There's a daughter and a, and a stepson, I believe. Um, I don't know much about that yet. I'm, I'm waiting to learn more. But, you know, I wonder this. And I don't know where it takes you. But I'm sure you wondered it as well. And that filthy pigsty that they maintained, all right, broken down place like that, with cash in the basement and, and so forth. How could this woman not notice anything was up after all these years? I mean, so somebody says, well, maybe she's a very abused woman. But she flies around to a lot of places. Um, In squalor, I have no idea why. It's got somebody's got to find that out. You know that that's an issue. That's a big issue in this case. It might be, especially because the three hairs are from her. Yeah. So you know, people say, well, she's the, the cops say she was definitely away, so she couldn't have done those, which is true. But you know, what does she know? Is a fascinating question. But remember, there's a husband-wife privilege, so nobody will ever know from her unless they get divorced. The but even then, there might be a, 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 a so. The daughter worked as an architect, it worked for his company. To go to yeah, his the daughter company. was working for his company. I heard that, yeah. yeah. Ben? Do you think the police regularly check 
along Ocean Parkway from the North Dock? I think they, they did. You know, um, I did. We went, walked around. We found a bone, and uh, it, was, it was some guys that were, you know, sleuths in this thing. They found a bone. Turned out to be an animal bone. But all the police cops came and called and said, "Listen, we found a bone." Um, so they, you know, they were paying attention. It, it's possible somebody was there. But you notice this guy never buried these people. Maybe he was lazy. You know, he, he never really tried to get rid of them very much. Yeah, but it's strange because think about how, how odd it is that if, if you've been over there, as I have, that's not a very wide area. Yeah. You know, you can walk from the, I walk from the beach on the, on the bay there, mm -hmm. and you can see that there's old baseballs and toys and things like that have floated up with the tides, and they're way up in the middle of the, of the marsh, so, uh, in that part. So, you know, people are on boats and stuff can come up there. It would be, if I were hiding a body, that would not be a good idea to leave it in a place like that. What about if somebody comes by jogging and smells it, sees it, you know, a dog goes and picks up a bone and comes in, you know, you would have to worry about all those things, right? And he didn't. No, he wanted, but it was, it's dark there. Though. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, at night it's dark there and it's low tide, you won't smell that body. Maybe not, but you might come across it. In other words, it's a risk. When you kill somebody and you plan it, you always have to worry about what? Time and distance. Because for every moment you're out there with the body in your truck, car, wherever, or burying it, for every moment you're moving distance, you're taking a risk. So you have to always try to decrease that risk, which is what he did. He put them not too far away from where, where he was. So they had to have been killed somewhere near there. Um, but that's just the theory, I guess. Anyway, um, I, did anybody else, and that's it? You know, and, well, um, <clears throat> you can tell I'm losing it, right? <laughs> I've got more. <laughs> There's one more tonight, right? And uh, <clears throat> uh, tomorrow is more, believe it or not, in the morning. And then, uh, is there anything else? In the evening. We have some in the evening as well. More media. So it's getting a little wearisome, honestly. I, I hope I stay rational, that's all, through the whole thing. But I hope I've been shared with you interesting things so that you're not just reading it, but you're participating in it by hearing it uh, and getting a, a better idea of our perspective, you know, and, and for these poor souls that lost it. And one more thing about, about the idea of sex workers. Um, it, they're commonly thought of I think you'll agree, uh, as you know, tough girls who may have had it hard growing up, but uh, you know, right away were, you know, they were no good. They just, you know, had a bad, bad attitude, and you know, maybe they drink too much and, and use too much, too much coke or whatever, and there they are, and they they're getting there the easy way, and that's why they're suffering. That's maybe once true. I don't know. But I don't think it's any longer true. I think in the generation that we're talking about of these girls, already with the internet, the advent of the internet, sex became very highly organized, like many other businesses. And sex has become, in my investigations, an enormously um, controlled operation by people in, in, in very, um, what's the right word, uh, organized places. And I'll tell you why I say that. One more fascinating story, and, and we're done. But, uh, but two, three years ago, people in Hollywood called me up. They had, you know, they, I, I know it was a friend of mine. She had done a story that I did uh, on a case uh, with the uh, Bridge of Spies, that movie with the, the guy had done a case involving that, uh, that whole incident with, uh, you know, the, the planes crashing and all that. So. They did, they did a documentary. They started a documentary. And this woman, you know, so we got to be friends. Uh, and she called me and said, listen, we have this little group. We have a people up in Buffalo who have, one woman has a daughter who was a, a sex worker. And she, um, she was found in, a, in 2009 in a can in Buffalo, upside down, frozen, and naked, and with the top on it. But she had heroin in her system because she was a heroin addict, 
The heroin amount was below regular, normal, and they declared her to have an accidental death. So they said, you can help out here. That would be a good case for you to deal with if you would help us. So I agreed to do it. I did it pro bono. I went up there. I challenged the findings. We had experts tested. We had all this stuff. We had executed. The body had been executed. I didn't do it, but somebody else did. And five experts, some of them world-renowned, all said she was murdered. Uh, but the, the government fought us and said, too late. You should have brought that up four months after she died. Otherwise, the statute of limitations ran out, and they threw out the case. I appealed it, and I argued it myself in Rochester just a few, like two, three months ago, and they upheld the, the lower court, said, too late, too tough luck. Um, when I was talking to that woman, who was the mother, her name is Leslie, of um, Amanda Winchowski, the, the girl, beautiful girl, by the way, uh, I said to her, you know, I'm the lawyer for the Long Island serial killer case. And she said, no, I didn't know that. I said, yeah, we have a girl named Melissa Bartholomew who lived in Buffalo, in Lockport, um, and she's froze. And she said, John, she said, my daughter was Melissa Bartholomew's co-worker. They were partners in the trade, and they flew together out to California back before they died uh, uh, together and were involved with a bottom girl out there and was set up with some Hollywood figures. So we located the bottom girl. I found her living in the Midwest. So we do some pretty good work too. And uh, I spoke to her at length. She was no longer a bottom girl. She went to prison, then she got out and managed to break away. And she told me, I said, I've sent you a picture of this girl, Shannon Gilbert. And, she's, and she looked at it, she said, I, she looks vaguely familiar, but it could be anybody, but it, it could have been somebody I knew. And uh, she, I, I asked her, did she come out to California? Because they trained them out there. They actually trained them. It's like a management system. They trained them in this stuff. Um, and she said, you know, she wasn't sure. So I checked Shannon's records, and several weeks before she died, she had flown to California. So uh, it's fascinating, isn't it? And we found that the, the girls that the bottom girls recruit and that the, the uh, what they, they call... Um, Gorillas, that's a new name for pimp. Uh, they don't look for, you know, the tough, hard-bitten girls. They're not worth a lot of money. They look for the lonely, young, sad little girls from small towns who have big dreams, are very naive, and have the characteristic of loyalty. They look for that. And uh, who are very sweet and charming. Then that's who they recruit. How do they recruit them? They hold out, they, the girls come in, they drive in a fancy car, a Lamborghini, they, they buy them, they take them right away, they take them to you know, a place to buy dresses, and buy them dresses, fix them up, make them feel really good about themselves, tell them how wonderful they are, really treat them like queens. And then they begin slowly by slowly to abuse them and beat them. And eventually they viciously beat them and then once they do that, they have them under control. It's as in, you'll keep getting the baubles, you'll keep getting good things, and you'll be going to Hollywood, but you know, if you don't, you're gonna get beaten. And then they would put them in with group sex, and then they, they now were in their, in, their, in their control. And they would sell them as, as, as if they were slaves. So that movie that, that exaggerated all that in Paris and so on, that's a true story. That really does happen. I, we, we actually, when I talked to the bottom girl, that was all true. So these girls are, you know, they're more sympathetic. I mean, listen, you know, yeah, they make a, made a mistake, but they're not like bank robbers. You know, they're not like people who, who shoot you, and that kind of thing. They're giving up something of themselves foolishly, incredibly naively. They're, and they were sweet girls. There's some real sympathy that you need for them. And that's what I feel. And that's why I keep going.